This is BBC One in the East. Now the news at 10 o'clock with George Alagaya and Carol Bundock. The fate of the US presidency hangs on the verdict of seven judges. The Florida Supreme Court will decide whether a recount of votes is legal. Britain pledges its troops to Europe's rapid reaction force. And a deal on the dome, it's set to become a high-tech business park. And here in the East, the Suffolk clergyman starting a prison sentence tonight after swindling his flock out of thousands. And still no identity for the man found dead and half-naked in a cupboard. Good evening. Seven men and women judges in the Florida Supreme Court tonight hold the balance between the two men who seek the presidency of the United States of America. Just half an hour ago, the judges finished hearing the arguments on whether the hand counting of votes in the crucial state of Florida is legal. If they rule in favor, the Democrat Al Gore is likely to pick up extra votes. As things stand, the Republican George W. Bush has just enough votes to take him to the White House. Our special correspondent, Gavin Hewitt, is at Florida's Supreme Court. 73, 74, 75. Two weeks after America voted, the people were allowed into Florida's Supreme Court to catch a glimpse of history and to attend a hearing that might just finally resolve who won the race for the presidency. Arriving at the court, senior advisers for both candidates, James Baker with the Bush campaign, also walking up the courthouse steps, lawyers acting on behalf of Vice President Al Gore. The main issue to be settled, whether recounts by hand should be included in Florida's final election results. Al Gore currently has fewer votes than George W. Bush and needs the recounts to have any chance of winning. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye! The court gave each side an hour to make their arguments. The Chief Justice underlined the importance of the occasion. The court uh, is certainly uh, aware of the historic uh, nature of this session. Lawyers on Al Gore's side of the argument said the issue was one of fairness. It was important to re-examine ballots that machines had failed to count. It's flatly wrong. It, it elevates the, the machines over voters. We have a situation in Palm Beach County where the election officials reported that 10,000 people, 10,000 ballots, did not record a vote for president. Now that should raise an issue. But the court questioned whether it would be right to allow just three counties to have a recount by hand. Al Gore's lawyers conceded they would be willing to see a recount by hand across the whole state. If you concluded that it was essential to avoid unfairness or uh, some kind of overweighting of one county's vote over another county's vote, this court has within it its equitable power to uh, have a, a statewide recount. But George Bush's legal team said it was impossible to examine ballots by hand and read the voters' mind, and it was too late to reinterpret the laws under which elections had been conducted. And I would urge that the court not, after the election has been held, change the rules by which the election should be conducted. The hearing has just ended, and the seven judges must now give their ruling. Should they order the recounts to stop on the grounds that they don't adhere to Florida law, that would almost certainly give George Bush the presidency. Or do they allow them to continue, giving Al Gore the chance to overtake his rival? Gavin Hewitt, BBC News, Tallahassee. And let's join Gavin Hewitt now, uh, who's uh, at the court in Tallahassee. Gavin, I know either man could take this on and on to the uh, Supreme Court in Washington if necessary, but surely there must come a time before that when one of them has to sort of bow out gracefully. Well, I've noticed that in recent days, several senior politicians have been saying that this court hearing uh, in uh, Tallahassee today, this Supreme Court hearing, should be the end of legal battles. Now, this could be very tough on Al Gore, because if the court decides the recounts can't go ahead, George W. Bush would effectively be the winner. And then Al Gore would face the toughest decision of his life. Should he concede or risk taking this to a higher court and alienating the American public? Gavin, I know I don't want you to try to second-guess the verdict, but what's your overall impression of today's proceedings? 
Well, the judges were very interventionist. They interrupted, particularly George Bush's lawyers. They were robust. They were skeptical. I noticed twice that the Chief Justice said we should be concerned about the voters' interests. And this would suggest they are concerned about those who are claiming that their interests haven't been taken into account. They also said that there was no immediate deadline beyond December the 12th. And just one further thing, they also, the court has just announced that there will be no decision on this today. Gavin, thank you very much. 12,500 troops, 72 combat aircraft and 18 Royal Navy warships. That's Britain's commitment to a new European Union rapid reaction force. Britain is one of the biggest contributors to the force, which will be operational by 2003. The Conservatives claim the force is a step towards a European superstate. This was the moment British troops crossed into Kosovo last year. The operation was supported by many countries, but one of them, America, made the whole thing possible. And now Europe wants to put that right. So today, the European Union summoned its top brass. What began as the common market many years ago is starting on a new military path. The reality is that the Americans, over very many years, have understandably criticised Europe for not being able to make a sufficient contribution. This is Europe's response, and for the first time, Europe will be able to make an effective contribution. The French have been pushing hardest for this new European force. In this exercise, the French military show how they can guard their own people anywhere in the world. The French ambition is to be leaders of a European Union with global power, an economic giant with military muscle. We try to influence world affairs through Europe. So it's natural that, at least for its own political goals, its own political aims, Europe should have its own uh, military capacity. So what will this force actually do when it starts in three years' time? Well, there could be rescue missions, as in Sierra Leone recently, humanitarian relief, helping out in disasters like floods, and peacekeeping, intervening in places such as Bosnia, which leaves many wondering where this will all lead. What hasn't been agreed here today is exactly how this new force will tie in with Europe's traditional military alliance, NATO. The fear among some is that the EU at this building will start to rival NATO based a few miles up the road. Ministers say they won't allow that to happen, but the risk is that as the EU is armed, NATO will be undermined. This French headquarters is designed to operate separately from NATO, which is exactly the kind of thing fueling the current controversy in Britain. The Conservatives say today's step is dangerous. These plans are a political organisation, an EU-based Euro army, that will actually uh, lead to the dilution and break-up of NATO and will actually create no extra capability in Europe but lead to the aggrandisement, the superpower concepts that seem to be running around in some of the EU minds, including the Prime Minister's. The American military are watching nervously. They want Europe to pay more for defence, but not to go its own way. NATO's dominance in European security affairs will be undermined. Europe will have its own means of action, and NATO cannot dictate whether or not European responses will be made. The French have been showing how potent the new European force will be, while Britain says it won't get dragged into operations it doesn't agree with. Today's decisions are momentous and may change the whole character of the European Union. David Shukman, BBC News in Brussels. And John Pina, our political correspondent, is at Westminster. John, I know this sounds like an obvious question, but what does Britain get out of this? Well, we've been hearing a lot from ministers recently, George, about the need to engage constructively in Europe, and this is precisely the kind of thing they mean. In or out of the European single currency, it's an opportunity for the government to show its pro-Europeanism. But it's also an opportunity, as we've seen in that report, for the Conservatives to accuse Labour of leading Britain by stealth into a European superstate. Now, the Prime Minister and other ministers say there's no question of that. The British forces wouldn't be committed without government say-so, and they're accountable to the UK Parliament. But for many people, the armed forces and what appears on military insignia and flags are a characteristic of nationhood and we can expect this argument to be batted back and forwards between the parties at election time. But John it isn't just the Eurosceptics who are against this whole uh, thing are they? 
No, and it's not just the Conservatives accusing or suggesting that this Euro force could undermine the link with America within NATO. Uh, just today, we've seen Lord Healy, the former Labour uh, Defence Secretary, joining with others in putting precisely that argument. Now, tonight, the Prime Minister has been dismissing that out of hand. On his way to Moscow to meet the Russian President, he described it all as, as a scaremongering nonsense. On another front, there'll be those in East European countries waiting to join the EU who will fear being left out in the cold. So you can see that this is really just the beginning and not the end of a long and complex argument. John, thank you very much. It looks as if the Millennium Dome is to become a high-technology business park. The Legacy Consortium says its plans will create several thousand jobs when the dome closes at the end of the year. But although Legacy is the government's preferred bidder, contracts have yet to be signed. After soaking up £628 million of lottery money, the dome's at last found a buyer. But its days as a visitor attraction are numbered. The zones will be demolished and the chief executive, P.Y. Gerbeau, has failed in his efforts to buy it and run it himself. Well, my friend P.Y. Gerbeau is a great enthusiast and I think he will be very disappointed because I think he really believed in and had a passionate belief in it. But nonetheless, uh, he has to recognise, I'm sure, that this was a very late entry into what was been a, has been a very long process of negotiation. All right, not bad. Legacy first expressed interest in the Dome a year ago. Its website shows what the inside of what it's calling Knowledge City will look like in future. One model is Cambridge Science Park, which brings together academics, high-tech industries and possible financial backers on a single site. By the end of the transformation um, of the space, some 14,000 people will be employed within the Dome. So this is real regeneration of the Thames Gateway area. The legacy deal's worth £50 million cash down and a possible £250 million if tenants come forward as fast as the company hopes. But the government was told that demolishing the dome and selling off the land would make more money. Whatever happens as a result of today's announcement, the dome will be idle and empty for a long part of next year and it's unlikely to represent good value for taxpayers' money either. We are content that we've got best value for the, the taxpayer and for the public, that we've got the best deal that, um, uh, that is possible at this stage, uh, but of course there's a lot of work to do to make sure that that deal is secured and before the contract is signed. Legacy has been granted the status of a preferred bidder and has until February to conclude the deal. The last preferred bidder, Nomura, walked away before completion. The government will be hoping that doesn't happen this time and that they can finally draw a line under what's become a financial and political disaster. Nick Hyam, BBC News, Westminster. Israel has carried out a major bombardment of Palestinian targets in the Gaza Strip. More than 30 Palestinians are reported to have been injured. Israel said it was retaliating for a bomb attack on a school bus travelling from a Jewish settlement in Gaza which killed two Jewish settlers. Our Middle East correspondent Hilary Anderson reports. With almost every minute came another shell. Israeli helicopters and warships unleashed their might. The center of Gaza was in a panic. The missiles hit Palestinian Authority security buildings. An Israeli bus was bombed this morning, and Israel blamed Yasser Arafat. The PA is, is directly responsible for the uh, operation, for the execution of the last uh, event and we find no way but to respond the same way that any other free world democracy would um, in our case. Scores of Palestinians were taken to hospital. Some civilian homes were hit too. The Israelis say it's not over yet. The Palestinians have vowed revenge. Tonight's attacks by the Israelis were the most extensive in several weeks, and they've brought to a crashing end what had been a brief lull in the fighting. Diplomatic efforts to solve the crisis simply aren't working, and both sides are accusing the other now of treating this like a war. When this Israeli school bus was bombed this morning in the center of Gaza, that's what it felt like for Israelis. The shrapnel sliced through, Many were injured, including children, some severely. And two died. One, Miriam Amitai, a mother of four, was laid to rest today. A teacher killed on her way to school. Islamic extremist groups claimed responsibility for the bus attack. Yasser Arafat denied involvement. 
But for this pain here in Israel today, all the Palestinians of Gaza are being made to pay. Hilary Anderson, BBC News, Jerusalem. Child offenders as young as 10 may soon be forced to wear electronic tags. Electronic tagging has so far only been used to monitor offenders over the age of 16. The Home Office now plans to give magistrates in England and Wales the option of imposing tagging orders instead of custodial sentences or community supervision. Prince Charles has opened the Millennium Seed Bank in West Sussex. It's designed to save thousands of plant species threatened with extinction. More than 300 million seeds, including all of Britain's wild plants, will eventually be stored in what the Prince called the Bank of England of the Botanical World. The world's first rotating bridge has been lifted into place on the River Tyne. Pedestrians and cyclists will be able to use the Gateshead Millennium Bridge when it opens next year. The bridge rotates upwards to let boats sail underneath. The British Medical Association says government plans to improve the NHS in England are threatened by a shortage of doctors. The BMA claims that targets to cut patient waiting times by 2004 won't be met unless thousands more GPs are recruited. But the government insists it can keep its promises. Waiting and the NHS often go together. And to deliver a better service, we need more family doctors. That much just about everyone agrees. But as this inner city practice in Birmingham shows, the health service is already struggling to replace those GPs it has already got. And I'm going to give you some tablet, Dr. Vanu Gopal retired three years ago. He said to come back because they couldn't find anyone to replace him. There are thousands of other Asian GPs about to retire serving similar communities. And that's bound to have an impact on the government's national plan. I think NHS plan is a utopia for someone to sit down in their nice plush offices to think that we can achieve it. But it cannot be done. What you need is manpower. Manpower, where is the manpower? Under the plan, the government has promised that by 2004, every patient in England will be seen by their doctor within 48 hours. Today, the British Medical Association said that was unrealistic without a lot more GPs. I hope we get more than the 2,000 minimum that Mr Milburn said. If we don't, then there's going to be great difficulty in reaching uh, the sort of targets like access to GPs in, in 48 hours right across the country. The government, though, points to practices like this, which already managed to see all their patients within a couple of days. And there are certainly doctors who believe better organisation can deliver better results. I think there's tremendous grounds for enthusiasm and, and confidence that we will meet those targets. It's not just about GP numbers, it's about getting everybody in the health service to work together and more effectively. Ministers say the telephone advice service NHS Direct will also help reduce demand on GPs, but they know recruitment remains the real challenge ahead. One of the great obstacles facing the NHS will be finding the skilled doctors and nurses who are needed to make it all happen. There is still a real question mark over whether they will be able to achieve that. Neil Dixon, BBC News, at the Department of Health. Train companies have issued emergency timetables. They include the changes caused by speed restrictions following the Hatfield crash. But rail companies have warned there could still be long delays and the timetables could differ from week to week. The end of another long journey on the crippled East Coast Main Line. These passengers arriving at London's King's Cross have been held up by speed limits and flood damage. The general view, there's not a lot you can do about it. I expected to get here for about one o'clock. Um, what time is it now? It's, uh, it's about five to four now, so, so it's been a bit long. There seemed to be a very long wait to get, to get on a train to London. It was over an hour from Retford and the trains were extremely crowded. We left at 10. <laughs> And it's now four o'clock. But their normal timetables have been abandoned and replaced with emergency plans that train companies say they can keep to. Even they may need to be rewritten each week. The big worry is Christmas. The timetables for the festive season won't be published for another fortnight. More uncertainty. So basically, if people want to start booking now for Christmas, they can. 
um, what we will try and do is make sure that there are services of some sort in place to make sure they get to their destinations. And otherwise, if worst comes to the worst, then obviously they will be eligible to get a refund if necessary. There are warnings tonight that popular cheap fares for passengers booking in advance are at risk. As we run up to Christmas, we understand that a number of the cheaper tickets are being withdrawn. And the reason the train companies are doing this is to manage demand, to avoid overcrowding. But again, it's the passenger that ends up suffering. Passengers are still waiting for details of a compensation scheme promised by the rail industry. But what they want most of all is better information. The new timetables may be fragile, but they do at least provide some idea of when trains are going to get to their destinations. Tom Simons, BBC News, Kings Cross Station. The world's biggest polluter, the United States, has said it is prepared to make concessions to reduce emissions of damaging greenhouse gases. Earlier, France's President Chirac told the climate change conference in Holland that America had to cast aside its doubts before the world reached the point of no return. These are tough times, four days left and still no deal. Few will openly make concessions, but it became clear tonight that is beginning to happen behind the scenes. As ministers and world leaders arrived to take control of the talks, the French president attacked America for prevaricating. Chaque Américain émet trois fois plus de gaz à effet One American creates three times as many greenhouse gases as a Frenchman, he said. U.S. consumers and their cars and industry produce a quarter of the world's greenhouse gases. America argues instead of ending up in the atmosphere causing global warming, the most important gas, carbon dioxide, can be absorbed by forests and farmland. They wanted this idea to be a major plank of any deal, but their chief negotiator now says they'll compromise extensively. We want only real measures, but whenever we find real measures that can reduce uh, carbon concentrations by absorption, we ought to use them. Europe says they shouldn't produce the gases in the first place. Britain's environment minister demonstrated a simple alternative to the car, but also announced a £69 million package for cleaner vehicles. The arrival of a powerful group of politicians has, it seems, brought this major concession from America. It won't be enough to secure a final deal, but things are beginning to move. Margaret Gilmore, BBC News, The Hague. Campaigning is underway in three parliamentary constituencies in England and Scotland. Thursday sees by-elections in West Bromwich West and Preston. But in Scotland, there are two battles in the late Donald Dewar's old seat of Glasgow, Annesland. There's one election for the Westminster seat and another for the Scottish Parliament. Welcome to Glasgow, Annesland and new politics. Single constituency, double by-election. But there's a charmingly old-fashioned feel to this Scottish contest, largely across the SNP Labour fault line. Henry MacLeish succeeded the late Donald Dewar as Scotland's First Minister. Labour starts well ahead, but knows the voters need reassurance. Well, this is a campaign about honest policy making. I think the people are interested in policies, education, health, housing and pensions. But at the end of the day, this is not about being too technical, being too slick, too fancy. This is Labour linking with the people. This constituency spreads from the affluence of Glasgow's West End Cappuccino zone through solid housing to the despair that is the huge Drumchapel estate. Naturally, Labour's opponents focus on the downside. The Nationalists say Labour in power has been a letdown. Well, Labour are responsible for the condition of people within Annie's land and the condition of public services. And uh, they're losing the trust of the electorate because the things they promised, like lower waiting lists, are actually increasing. There are more than 16,000 pensioners in Annesland. Labour's opponents recall the 75 pence pension increase. Labour stresses next April's £5 minimum rise plus other benefits. The Tories aren't alone in wooing the pensioners, but they believe they can prosper as the alternative Scottish opposition. The Labour Party's on its way out. Whether it's this week, next week, next year, there's going to be a need for change. Scotland's not a one-party state. And people do not want nationalism, which would break up the whole of the United Kingdom. In this political dance, the Liberal Democrats have to tread carefully. They are in opposition at Westminster, but share power with Labour in the Scottish Parliament. 
the voters are actually quite sophisticated about recognising the two different levels of Parliament, if you like, handle different things and we can handle them in different ways depending on our position. Labour should win here, although the party has struggled in recent Scottish by-elections. The key factor could be turnout. In simple terms, who's more inclined to vote? Labour's core support or the disaffected? Brian Taylor, BBC News, Glasgow, Anisland. A total of six candidates are taking part in the by-election for the Westminster seat for Glasgow and Island. Donald Dewar held a seat in the 1997 general election for Labour with a majority of more than 15,000 votes. And seven candidates are standing in the by-election for the constituency's Scottish Parliament seat. Football and in tonight's Premiership match between Coventry City and Ipswich at Highfield Road, a goal in the last minute of the game from Fabian Wilness secured all three points for Ipswich. They move to fifth in the Premiership. I'll be back a little later with the latest on the day's headlines, but now the news where you are. Good evening, I'm Carol Bundock. First tonight, a 66-year-old man has been arrested following a double shooting which has left a woman dead and another man injured. Police were called to the Norfolk village of Ingham this afternoon after a 39-year-old man suffering from a shotgun injury went to a doctor's surgery in nearby Stalham. The older local man was taken into custody where he is helping police with their inquiries. A clergyman from Suffolk is tonight starting a prison sentence for dishonesty. The Reverend Trevor Jones from Stowe Market has been jailed for nine months. Trevor Jones sharing a joke with his barrister today, well aware he was likely to end up in jail. The newly ordained vicar arrived at St Peter and St Mary's in Stowe Market in 1996. Out went the traditional congregation, in came the evangelists. Then the whispers that money was going missing. Last month, he went on trial at Ipswich Crown Court, denying 12 charges, including deception and theft. Days later, he changed his plea to guilty on four charges of dishonesty, relating to over £17,000. During his trial, it emerged Jones had a string of previous convictions and had been to prison twice, the last time in 1983 for deception, before he found God through the evangelist Billy Graham. His crimes have left a bad taste in the town. People are very disappointed, upset, annoyed and even saddened by it all. It's, it's just been a big disruption really to the whole town. There's widespread dismay Jones was able to be ordained as a vicar. Now the task of rebuilding the damage done must begin. Although the case has come to an end, uh, it's not the end for a lot of people who've been hurt or defrauded in the process. And, in, and for them, uh, this, I'm afraid, is going to go on for some time. In sentencing Jones to nine months in prison, Judge John DeVoe said he committed a serious breach of trust. The question now is how can the church recover from his deceit and lies? Richard Daniel, BBC Look East, Stowe Market. The captain of Colchester United Football Club has been left shaken but unhurt by a road accident in the town. 33-year-old Simon Clark was driving a Ford Mondeo on Balkan Hill when the vehicle was in collision with a pedestrian at a Pelican Crossing this afternoon. The 49-year-old man was taken to Colchester Hospital but later died from his injuries. A post-mortem into the death of a man found in a cupboard in a flat in Essex has been delayed. The half-naked man, thought to be in his 20s, has not yet been identified. Police broke into this flat in Thorpe Lesoken yesterday after a tip-off. Inside, they found the half-naked body of a man concealed in a cupboard. Officers say there were no signs of a forced entry and no obvious injuries on the victim. The council has told police that a man and a woman were registered as tenants here. Officers are now trying to trace them. Neighbours say the couple, who'd only lived here for a matter of months, kept themselves to themselves. All I've done is uh, just spoke to them, saw them when they came by and took their stuff out of the car and went in the flat. That's the only time I've ever seen them. News of this suspicious death has shocked local residents and become the main talking point in this tiny North Essex village. Well, I went to a little children's party yesterday and come home about five and all I saw was police and a forensic scientific van sitting outside my house. That was the first inkling I knew something was up. It's something that uh, is going to uh, get around quite fast, a, a little village like this. Police have now set up an incident room and are appealing for anyone with information to contact them. Catherine Fairhall, BBC Look East, Essex. 
A Norfolk family is being put in emergency accommodation tonight after a last-ditch plea for a roof over their heads. They say they've been treated harshly and have nowhere to go. The Larkowski family out on the street. Elizabeth, her disabled husband Ivan and their children had to leave the Great Yarmouth Hotel where North Norfolk District Council have been putting them up for the past month. After being evicted by a housing trust for arrears and a dispute over thousands of pounds of housing benefit, the council believes they've made themselves homeless. In search of a roof over their heads, the family took their plea to the social services office at North Walsham. We need roof over our head to like survive anyway, but we've got no roof over our head and we don't know where we're sleeping tonight or anything. Disgusted, absolutely mm. disgusted that it can leave anyone homeless. Is that what the prospect is tonight? Yeah. Yes, it is. Where will you go if... Well, where will I'll you just go up to the council offices and just stay there. Because at the end of the day, they have, they've got to rehouse us. You know, they can't leave us on the streets. North Norfolk District Council says an offer of accommodation in Sheringham was rejected by the family. The Lukowskis say it was because of inadequate disabled access. This evening, an offer from County Hall of two days emergency accommodation, but no longer-term solution. Norfolk Social Services says it's in no position to provide a home for the family, while the District Council says the reasons for the Larkowski's homelessness means it has no duty to do so. It does say, though, that its officers will do all they can to help the family help themselves. Kim Riley, BBC Look East, Norfolk. In tonight's football, Ipswich Town were away to Coventry City in the Premiership. The final score, Coventry nil, Ipswich won. Terry Baxter was at the match. Ipswich continued their run in the Premiership, another three points, but they left it until the death. The first half belonged to Coventry, full of commitment and passion. Gordon Strachan's side caused Ipswich problems aplenty without a productive result. Ipswich made a game of it in the second period, but it wasn't until the final minute that the game was decided. Sub Martin Royce the provider from the left for left wing-back Fabian Wilders to head home from six yards. Fifth tonight, George Burley, the Scottish manager with the smile. Coventry nil, Ipswich won. Good for them. Now, a look at the weather and tonight, fog and frost forming in most parts, but patchy cloud and isolated showers affecting the coasts in Essex and Suffolk. Feeling cold though as temperatures hit freezing and tomorrow that fog will be slow to clear, but then largely dry and bright with some sunny spells. That's it for now from us. Time to go back to George Allagaya in London for the headlines. The main news tonight, Florida's Supreme Court has the fate of the U.S. presidency in its hands tonight. Seven judges have been hearing arguments about whether the recounting of votes is lawful. And Britain is contributing 12,000 troops, 70 combat aircraft and 18 warships to the European Union's new rapid reaction force. Tonight's Newsnight features a disturbing investigation into child sex abuse within the family through one victim who went undercover to expose her stepfather's depravity. I was having full sex with Stanley, I think I was about four. That's a Newsnight special on child sex abuse starting now on BBC Two. But from the 10 o'clock news, good night. Hello, good evening. We've had some showers around today, but we're now looking out towards the west at our next area of low pressure. This is heading our way, and it's going to join forces with the low pressure system that we've got already, bringing with it a band of cloud and rain which is expected to push northwards across England and Wales tomorrow. And you can see how tightly packed these isobars are down towards the south. We're expecting severe gales in some places, and towards the English Channel, we could see gusts tomorrow night up to around 60 or 70 miles an hour. Now, not only are we watching for this increase in wind, we're also watching for the rain, which we are expecting across England and Wales over the next 36 hours. Now, we could see another inch or so of rain in parts of southwest England, adding to the flooding problems we already have. We have several floods, uh, several rivers in southwest England on flood watch, and we still have a severe flood warning in force on the River Eyre in Yorkshire. Now, if you are at all worried about your area, here's that flood line as always, 0845 988 11188.
Now we still have a few showers around at the moment. They are wintry in places, and these showers down towards the southeast could continue on and off throughout the night. And we could also see further showers up towards the northeast of Scotland. But for many of us, it's going to be dry, clear, and foggy, and it's also going to turn frosty. Temperatures in many countryside areas will drop below freezing. So driving conditions throughout the night and into tomorrow morning are likely to be quite difficult. We could see visibilities down to around 100 metres in places and indeed we could well see some icy stretches on untreated roads. So a misty, murky, foggy start to the day tomorrow. That fog only very slowly clearing into a low cloud as the morning goes on. Now we could see a little bit of brightness around across England and Wales before cloud and outbreaks of rain push up from the southwest, perhaps turning to snow over the high ground of northern England. Further towards the north, there'll be a mixture of sunny spells and showers once we get rid of the early morning fog. And it is going to feel raw tomorrow, a top temperature in some areas of just 5 or 6 degrees. But we could see those temperatures peaking at around 9 or 10 late in the day down towards the south. So on Wednesday it looks like it's going to be windy and unsettled yet again. One area of low pressure moves towards the north on Wednesday and then another one it looks like it could push in towards the southeast on Thursday. So a band of heavy rain is expected to push north and east on Wednesday. It'll dry out on Wednesday night, so some frost and fog again. And then there's a possibility of some more wet weather for southeastern areas later on. That's the forecast.